The Cube presents HPE Discover 2022. Brought to you by HPE. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Cube's continuous coverage, HPE Discover 2022 and from Las Vegas, the formerly Sands Convention Center, now Venetian. John Furrier and Dave Vellante here. We're excited to welcome in Jen Huffstetler, who's the Chief Product Sustainability Officer at Intel. Jen, welcome to The Cube. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. You're really welcome. So you dial back, I don't know, the last decade and nobody really cared about it. But some people gave it lip service, and, but, but corporations generally weren't as in tune. What's changed? Why has it become so top of mind? I think uh, in the last year we've noticed as we all were working from home, that we had a greater appreciation for the balance in our lives and the impact um, that climate change was having on the world. So I think across the globe, there's regulations, industry, and even personally, um, everyone is really starting to think about this a little more and corporations specifically are trying to figure out how are they going to continue to do business um, in, in these new regulated environments. And IT leaders generally weren't in tune because they weren't paying the power bill for years, it was the facilities people, but, but then they started to come together. How should leaders in technology, business tech leaders, IT leaders, CIOs, how should they be thinking about their sustainability goals? Yeah, I think for, for IT leaders specifically, they really want to be looking at the footprint of their overall infrastructure. So whether that is their on-prem data center, their cloud instances, um, what can they do to maximize the resources and lower the footprint that they contribute to their company's overall footprint. Mm -hmm. um, so IT really has a critical role to play, I think, because as you'll find um, in IT, the carbon footprint of the data center, of those products in use is actually, it's fairly significant. So having a focus there will be key. You know, compute's always been one of those things where, you know, Heat, Intel's been makes chips so that you know, heat is important and compute. What is Intel's current goals? Um, give us an update on where you guys are at. What's your, uh, what's your ideal goal in the long term? Where are you now? You guys always had a focus on this for a long, long time. Where are we now? Because I won't say the goalposts have changed. They're changing the definitions of what this means. What's the current state of Intel's carbon footprint and overall? Uh, goals. Yeah, no, thanks for asking. As you mentioned, we've been invested in lowering our environmental footprint for decades. Uh, in fact, without uh, action otherwise, um, you know, we've already lowered our carbon footprint by 75%. So we're really in that last mile. And that is why we, when we recently announced um, a very ambitious goal, uh, net zero 2040 for our scope one and two, for our manufacturing operations. Um, this is really an industry leading goal and partly because the technology doesn't even exist, right? For the chemistries and for making um, the, the silicon into the sand into you know, computer chips yet. And so by taking this bold goal, we're going to be able to lead the industry, partner with academia, partner with consortia, and that drive is going to have ripple effects across the industry and all of the components in semiconductors. Is there, is there a changing definition of net zero? What that means, because some people say they're net zero, and maybe in one area they might be, but maybe holistically across the company. As it becomes more of a broader mandate, society, employees, partners, yeah. Wall Street, are all putting pressure on companies. Is the net zero conversation changed a little bit or what's your view on that? I think we definitely see it changing and with changing regulations like those coming forth from the SEC here in the US and in Europe. Um, net zero can't just be lip service anymore, right? It really has to be real reductions on your footprint um, and we say it then otherwise, and even including in our uh, supply chain goals, what we've taken new goals to reduce, but our operations are growing. So I think everybody is going through this uh, realization that, you know, mm -hmm. with the growth, how do we keep it lower than it would have been otherwise, keep focusing on those reductions, and have not just renewable credits that could have been bought in one location and applied to a different geographical location, but real credible offsets uh, for where the, the product's manufactured or the compute's deployed. Jen, when you talk about you've reduced already by 75%, you're on that last mile. We, we listened to Pat Gelsinger very closely. Up until recently, he was the number one most frequently had on the cube guest. Um, <laughs> he's been busy, I guess. Yeah. But, but, but as you apply that discipline 
to where, where you've been, your existing business, and now Pat's laid out this plan to increase the foundry business. How does that affect your, are you able to carry through that reduction to you know, the new foundries? Do you have to rethink that? How does that play in? Certainly, well, I, the foundry expansion of our business with IDM 2.0 is going to include the existing factories that already have the benefit of those decades of investment mm -hmm. and focus. And then, you know, we have clear goals for our new factories in Ohio and Europe um, to achieve goals as well. That's part of the overall plan for Net Zero 2040. Um, it's inclusive of our expansion into Foundry, which means that many, many, many more customers are going to be able to benefit from the leadership that Intel has here. And then as we onboard acquisitions, as any company does, we need to look at the footprint of the acquisition and see what we can do um, to align it with our overall goals. Yeah, so sustainable IT was, I don't know, for some reason was always an area of interest to me. And, and when we first started, even before I met you, John, we worked with PG&E to help companies get rebates for installing technologies that would reduce their carbon footprint. Very forward thinking. And it, it was a hard thing to get, you know, but, but compute was the big deal. And there were technologies, I remember virtualization at the time was one where, and we would go in and explain to the PG&E PG &E engineers how that all worked. And, 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 and they, of course there, they had metrics and that they wanted to see, but at any rate, so virtualization was clearly one factor. What are the technologies today that people should be paying attention? Flash storage was another one. AI is going to have a big Reduce the spinning disk, but what are the ones today that are going to have an impact? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we like to think of the built-in acceleration that we have, including some of the early acceleration or for virtualization technologies um, as foundational. So built-in accelerated compute is green compute and it allows you to maximize the utilization of the transistors that you already have deployed in your data center. This compute is sitting there um, and it is ready to be used. What matters most is what you were talking about, John, that real world workload performance. And it's not just you know a lot of specsmanship around synthetic benchmarks, but AI performance. Yep. With the built-in acceleration that we have in Xeon processors with the Intel DL Boost, we're able to achieve 4X the AI performance per watt without you know, doing that otherwise. You think about the consolidation you were talking about that happened with virtualization. Right. You're basically effectively doing the same thing with these built-in accelerators that we have continued to add over time and have even more coming in our Sapphire generation. And you call that green compute? Um, or is it, what does that mean, green compute? Well, you are greening your compute okay, by increasing the utilization of your resources. If you're able to deploy AI, utilize the telemetry within the CPU that already exists. Um, we have customers, KDDI in Japan has a great um, proof point that they already announced on their 5G data center. Lower their data center power by 20%. That is real bottom line impact as well as carbon footprint impact by utilizing all of those built in capabilities. So yeah. We, we heard some stories okay. earlier in the, in the event here at Discover where there was some cooling innovations that was powering, moving the heat to power towns and cities. Yep. So you start to see, and, and, and you guys have been following this data center and been part of the whole, okay, in hot climates, you have cold climates, but there's new ways to recycle energy. Where, Where's that? Because that sounds very sci-fi to me that, oh yeah, the whole town runs on the data center exhaust. So there's now systems thinking around the compute. What's your, what's your reaction to that? What's the current uh, view on re-engineering a system to take advantage of that energy or recycling? I, I think when we look at our vision of sustainable compute, over this horizon, it's going to be required, right? We know that compute helps to solve society's challenges and it, the demand for it's not going away. So how do we take new innovations, looking at a systems level as compute gets further deployed at the edge, how do we make it efficient? How do we ensure that that compute uh, can be deployed where there is air pollution? Right? So some of these technologies that you had, they not only enable reuse, but they also enable some you know, closing in of the solution mm -hmm. to make it more robust for edge deployments. It'll allow you to place your data center wherever you need it. It no longer needs to reside in one place. Um, and then that's going to allow you to have those energy reuse benefits, either into district heating, if you're in you know, northern uh, Europe, 
or we, there's examples with folks putting greenhouses right next to a data center to start growing food in what were previously food deserts. So I don't think it's science fiction. It is how we need to rethink as a yeah. society yeah. Um, to utilize everything we have, at, the tools that are at our hand. There's, um, there's a commercial on the radio, on the East Coast anyway, I don't know if you guys hear it, it's that, what's your one thing? And, and, and the, the gentleman comes on, he talks about things that you can do mm -hmm. to help the environment, and he says, what's your one thing? So what's the one thing, or maybe it's not just one, that, that IT managers should be doing to affect carbon footprint? The one thing to affect their <laughs> carbon footprint. There are so many things. Hey, we, two, three, <laughs> I think tell me. If I was going to pick the one most impactful thing that mm -hmm. they could do in their infrastructure is, it's back to John's comment, it's imagine if the world deployed AI. All the benefits, not only in business outcomes, you know, the revenue, lowering the TCO, um, but also lowering the footprint. So I think that's the one thing they could do. If I could throw in a baby second, um, <laughs> it would be really consider how you get renewable energy into your computing ecosystem. And you know, at Intel, when we're 80% uh, renewable power, our processors are inherently low carbon yeah. because of all the work that we've done. Others have less than 10% renewable energy. So you want to look for products that have low carbon by design, any Intel-based system, uh, and where you can get renewables from your grid to ask for it, run your workload there. And even the next step, to get to sustainable computing, it's going to take everyone, including every enterprise, to think differently and really you know, consider what would it look like to bring renewables onto my site if I don't have access um, through my local utility. And many yeah. customers are really starting to evaluate that. Well, Jens, great, great to have you on the queue. Great insight into, into the current state of the art of sustainability and carbon footprint. Um, my final question for you is more about the talent out there the younger generation coming in, obviously the pressure, people want to work for a company that's mission driven, we know that. Yeah. Um, the Wall Street impact is going to be financial, business model, um, and then save the planet kind of pressure. So there's a lot of talent coming in. Is there awareness at the university level? Is there courseware, Can, do people get degrees in sustainability? There's a lot of people who want to come into this field. What are some of the talent um, backgrounds of people learning or want to who might want to be in this field. What would you recommend? How would you describe how to onboard into the career if they want to contribute? What are some of those factors? Because it's, it's not new, new, but it's, it's going to be globally aware. Yeah, well there, there certainly are um, degrees with focuses on sustainability, um, maybe to look at holistically at the enterprise, but where I think the globe is really going to benefit, we didn't really talk about the software inefficiency, and as we delivered more and more compute over the last few decades, mm -hmm. The pro, you know, the basically the programming languages got more inefficient. Yeah. So there's at least 35% inefficiency in the software. So being a software engineer, even if you're not an AI engineer, so AI would probably be the highest impact. Yep. Being a software engineer to focus on building new um, applications that are going to be efficient applications, that they're well utilizing the transistor, that they're not leaving zombie, you know, services running that aren't being utilized. So I actually think- So we're going to program an assembly? <laughs> <laughs> oh, day story. We'll get really efficient. <laughs> get machine language. I had to Maybe. throw that in there, sorry. Maybe no, not back no. that far. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. Well, no, but the, the, the question is, what's my career path? What's a hot career? Yeah. in this area, sustainability, AI, totally see that. Anything else, any other career opportunities you see are hot jobs or hot areas to work on? Um, yeah, I mean, just really, I, I think it takes every, every architect, every engineer to think differently about their design, whether it's the design of a building or the design of a processor or a motherboard. We have a whole low carbon architecture you know, set of ac actions that are, were underway that we'll take to the ecosystem. So it could really span from any engineering discipline, I think, but it's a mindset yeah. with which you approach yeah. that customer problem. That's system thinking, yeah. yeah. That's sustainability designed in. Jen, thanks so much for coming back in theCUBE, or coming on theCUBE, it was great to have you. Thank you. All right. Dave Vellante for John Furrier. We're sustaining the Cube. Uh, we're winding down day three. Day three. <laughs> <laughs> HPE Discover 2022. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.